that you can see what we're talking about. All right, so Mr. Alan Wallace, he is our special guest today. He is going to speak for about a half an hour and then we will answer questions at the end. So we're going to leave an answer, question answer pod up for you to all put in your questions. Um, and then we will select those questions and we will um, ask him at the end. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Alan Wallace. That's me there, I guess. Good morning. Thank you for having me, and uh, this is quite an opportunity. My pleasure. I would like to say that uh, I was in the military, active duty for four and a half years. I was a Navy hospital corpsman. I was in Vietnam all of 1968. I worked in a combat hospital, and I uh, was trained to work in an operating room. When I got out of the Navy uh, on Groundhog Day, 1970, I moved to Columbus, Ohio, got a job working in a city hospital, and I continued to work in the operating operating rooms uh, at, uh, until I uh, stopped doing that particular type of work and got into construction. 1981, I got hired as a federal firefighter in, uh, in uh, near Columbus, Ohio, an Air Force base called Rickenbacker. Uh, I was able to go to the Air Force Fire Protection Rescue School. 1983, and I worked at the Air Force Base Rickenbacker from uh, June of 81 until September uh, September of, eight, of 93. At that point, I went to I was transferred to the to Arlington, Virginia, to an Army post called Fort Myer. It's up on top of the hill behind Arlington Cemetery. And this is where all the Armed Forces Chiefs of Staff live. Uh, I would retire from the uh, firefighter job there at Fort Myer on my birthday. Uh, 2000, October 2003. The, uh, one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is the attack on 9-11 at the Pentagon. Uh, I was one of three firefighters assigned to the Pentagon Heliport Fire Station. Whenever there are any helicopters coming or going out of the Pentagon, there will be a crew there uh, at the, to operate the flight control tower. There will also be a crew to operate the emergency vehicle with firefighters assigned there from Fort Myer assigned there to the Pentagon Heliport Fire Station. On that morning, uh, let me tell you this first. September 10 was a Monday. There was a light rain, and we had some excitement that day. President Bush is coming over in the motorcade. He's going to, uh, uh, this is very exciting, all these vehicles, motorcycles. Of course, President Bush is in the limousine, not on one of the motorcycles. And uh, he, will, uh, he will arrive at the heliport get out of the car, he will enter the helicopter, turn around and wave, the helicopter doors will close, and the helicopter will depart. The, the travel plan at this point is for, for the helicopter to go to Andrews Air Force Base, which is over in Maryland, and uh, President Bush and his party will gather uh, up, they will board the Air Force One airplane, and the airplane will fly to Sarasota, Florida. They'll be at, actually be down there about 24 hours. Uh, President Bush's plan was to return to the uh, Washington, D.C. area, possibly the heliport, uh, the next day, September 11, at noon. Uh, of course, so now it is, it is September 11, Tuesday. Um, about 9 o'clock in the morning, we become aware of the attacks in New York City. I'd like to mention that uh, there were two firefighters with me also there at the heliport that morning, Tuesday, September 11. Firefighter Mark Skipper from Buffalo, New York, and Firefighter Dennis Young from, from Carroll County, Ohio. Uh, we would be the crew assigned to the Pentagon heliport until all the flying, helicopter flying that day was, as, was completed. Normally, I would never go to the heliport fire station. I would always have someone come up and want to switch assignments with me, and uh, that was perfectly, I was perfectly happy to do that because I didn't like to go to the heliport. There wasn't that much to do down there. And at this time of the year, especially in, in, the, in the early fall, there was a lot of Arlington Cemetery gave our fire department a lot of activity from falls, heart attacks, heat-related emergencies, things like that. So, and uh, but if I didn't have to go down there, 
I wouldn't go down there. Someone else would take my place because they wanted to. Um, about 9 o'clock or so, we become aware of the attacks in New York. Mark Skipper will come out to the apparatus area where I was seated, and he will tell me that they think there is an airplane that has crashed into the World Trade Center building. At this point, I had no idea what the World Trade Center building looked like. Uh, so then I get up from where my, I was seated, and we walk into the, what we call our day room, our lounge, there at the Heliport Fire Station. And uh, we're standing there watching the television, the New York City News, so uh, one of the announcers is trying to explain to the public uh, what, what, it, what they see there in, in Manhattan. And, uh, uh, and he begins to talk about that they're, they're, they're not real sure it was, that it was an airplane that crashed into the north, north side, the north side of the North World Trade Center Tower, Tower 1. Uh, they weren't sure if it was an airplane. If it was an airplane, they had no idea how big of an airplane it was. And then... Surprising, surprising me when it, one of the announcers says, this could even be a terrorist attack. And I thought, what a ridiculous thing to say. Anybody in their right mind knows that what has happened, it was an airplane that came out of JFK or LaGuardia, has crashed into the, the tallest building on the East Coast. No sooner do I say this than we become aware of the approaching second plane that will crash into the south side of the South Tower. This is United Flight. 175. Once this happens, there's no doubt about it, that, that anyone watching this knows that this is not an accident. This is an intentional act of violence against our country. Uh, I suppose Mark and Dennis and I watched the TV a few, probably for a few more minutes, and then Mark Skipper and I walked back outside. Dennis is still in the firehouse, probably watching the TV news or finishing up breakfast. Um, uh, about 9.30 or so, so, the fire chief from Fort Myer will call our fire station there to, at the heliport. Then Dennis will answer the phone, then the fire chief will talk to me, and he will also want to talk to Mark Skipper. I'm sure what he said to Mark and Dennis is what he said to me. Um, first of all, are you aware of what's going on in New York? Yes, sir, we are. And he said that at this point there had been no change in President Bush's scheduled return. There probably was. We were just so far down on the list of importance that we, we, even if there was, we probably would have never been notified. Um, he went on to, t to explain that uh, what has happened in New York could possibly happen here in the Washington, D.C. area. And if it did, you would likely be taking your brand new fire truck and responding to that situation. Uh, pretty much that's the way he left it. And again, he said, if I recall, if you have any problems, call the cops. So Mark eventually, after he gets off the phone, will join me out at the back of the fire truck. And by now, it's well after, uh, well after 9.30. So Mark and I, at the last possible second, I'll say, Mark and I began to walk to the front of the, the crash truck, this, this brand new, uh, very big uh, airfield type uh, firefighting vehicle. Uh, I use the phrase, I believe, crash truck. Uh, it's often referred to when, when a, when a, when a uh, emergency vehicle is assigned to uh, an airfield of some sort. Uh, Mark and I were walking to the front of the, of the fire truck. The fire truck is parked perpendicular, facing away from the Pentagon, and the fire truck is pointed out toward the heliport. Uh, this is exactly where I parked the fire truck the day before, exactly. Uh, Mark and I are probably talking about the Marine Corps or something that's, had, that's going on back at the main fire station. Mark and I get about 10 or so feet in front of the, uh, in front of the uh, fire truck, there is no warning at this point of what is about to happen or what is in front of us. Mark is, is to my right within arm's reach, uh, and I guess a flash or something off to my left, uh, and when I, look up, I, when I look up, I see the airplane that will crash into the Pentagon. This is, this is American Airlines Flight 77. It's loaded with, uh, uh, it's, I'm, I'm, make sure I get my numbers right, it's, it's loaded with, uh, 59 passengers and crew, and five hijackers. Five hijackers. Um, from the time we see the airplane, is, well, let me say it this way first. Uh, the airplane is probably 200 yards from our position, uh, and it is approaching the Pentagon at about a 45-degree angle. From the time we see the airplane until the airplane hits the building, can't be any more than a, than a second. Uh, the noise generated by the engines, I'm sure, was so loud 
once we once we see the airplane and only after we see the airplane do we hear this incredibly loud noise this noise is uh, i would later find it i would later describe it as being so loud that it, it nearly the noise nearly drowned out the sound of the airplane actually hitting the building and it surprised me it confused me for the longest time of why we heard why everybody else, why we thought the noise of the plane hitting the, the Pentagon was not particularly loud, uh, but it was loud because they heard it all over the county nearly. Um, and But anyway, but I began to realize sometime later, Mark Skipper and I heard two noises. We heard the noise from the, from the engines, I'm sure, and then almost immediately the airplane will hit the building and we hear this noise that I would describe later on as a crunch. Uh, Skipper and I never spoke of this. Later on that week, Mark Skipper is being interviewed by uh, Larry King in California, I believe. And, uh, and Mark described, Larry asked uh, Mark Skipper a question about the noise of the plane hitting the building. And, uh, and uh, Mark's answer was exactly like mine. A, it was just a crunch. And again, Mark and I never talked to this, talked of this. So I am hoping by the time we recognize all this that Mark and I are running. To be honest with you, I've completely forgot about Mark and Dennis and the two people in the flight tower. And I am running. I have very clear thoughts of what's going on. Now, here in Arlington, Virginia, we are being attacked. What should I do? I better run until I catch on fire, and after that I'll do whatever I whatever comes to mind. Out in front of me is a Ford van. Uh, it's parked parallel to the, to the fire station. It's facing away from me, facing north. Uh, this is the vehicle that Mark and Dennis and I used to bring our bring us down to the uh, down to the heliport. Um, it's a it's a 15 passenger Ford van, and uh, I I know that that vehicle is there, but I'm I would say that at this point I am probably not aware that it's right in front of me. So as I am running toward this van, I'm going to be running up along the the, uh, path, the driver's side of the van. I feel the pressure from the explosion, and then I feel the heat. It was. It got very hot, and more likely, Mark and I both were inside this fireball that was generated uh, from the explosion. Uh, it was. I mean, it was really hot, and so I. I. Uh, I, I so at a certain point, uh, I simply dove forward, and I'm sliding on the new blacktop there. And when I stop sliding, I'm right between the front and rear axles on the on the driver's side of the van. So I immediately crawled underneath the van, and uh, when I thought it was hot. I was running, and now it is really hot. So I crawled out from underneath the van, and when I do this, I, I, I must be looking over to my left, and I see Skipper out in the field, and I ran out and grabbed him, and I, I yelled at him, and I said, are you okay? And now, folks, Skipper did not answer my question, but I do remember what he said. I said to Skipper, get your stuff on, meaning get your fire pants, poke, <laughs> fire pants, coat, boots, and all that stuff. We have a lot of work to do. I am going to the fire truck, and I left Mark out in the field. I ran back through a field of burning debris. Uh, the fire truck has got what appears to be a, a huge blaze behind it, and, I'm, and at this point I'm beginning to, to have some thoughts of what should I do, what can I do. My plan was, however, to approach the fire truck and enter the passenger door, which I left this door open. I climbed up in the cab put my radio headsets on similar to what I'm wearing now. And uh, and I reached through the steering wheel and punched the start buttons and the fire truck started. I'm thinking, wow, what do I do now? Well, I was very good with the fire truck. I was a trainer on it. I was very familiar with it. My plan at that point was to push the emergency brake, push off the emergency brake, pull the transmission selector into the drive range and, and pull the fire truck away from the building. At this point, I'm thinking that the fire truck is being the fire behind at the, at the rear of the fire truck is part of the Pentagon that's on fire. Well, actually, at that point, there was no obvious fire at the Pentagon directly behind the truck. The fire that I was seeing was the fire truck. The fire truck was on fire. So there's a, an enormous amount of smoke coming up along the, the driver's side of the truck. It's coming through the dash. I am moving the transmission selector back and forth trying to, uh, to, to make the trying to get the fire truck to move. Actually, the fire truck never never did move after the crash. Uh, I would eventually, uh, while I'm in there trying to make the fire truck work, I look over to my 
over to my right, and I see Skipper outside the door there, and he's signaling me something like this. What he wants, what he means is for me to turn off the fire truck. Now, I wasn't worried about what Skipper was concerned about. I'm trying to figure out what I have done wrong, or have I done something wrong, or out of sequence, uh, and why does the fire truck not respond as it should. So uh, um, while I am in the fire truck, and I see Skipper do this at least one more time, uh, so while I am in the fire truck, uh, realizing it's what, we're, what, we're, what we are trying to do is not working. So I decide to make this radio call, uh, and this radio call is, is called the size up, and it's given by an emergency uh, responder that would be the first, we'll say the first person who comes on the scene of an incident. Could be a front end collision, two automobiles, people trapped. Uh, it could be heavy smoke showing, two story residence, whatever. It's given by the first responding uh, company that comes in there. And, then what, and the people who are going to hear this are the people that are, are coming in on this assignment for that particular emergency, giving them a heads up of what to expect once they do get on the scene. So my, my message was simple. Uh, my call sign would have been Foam 61, and I'm calling Fort Meyer at the main fire station. The guys that are going to hear this radio message are Bob Cornally from Canton, Ohio, and uh, and uh, the firefighters are in this class that, that is being done at Fort Myer. My message was simply, phone 61, Fort Myer. We have had a commercial airliner crash into the west side of the Pentagon at the heliport, the Washington Boulevard side. Come at once. <coughs> Excuse me. I took my headsets off and threw them up in a dash. Killed the engine. Turned off the, the fire truck engine. Threw my gut, got ready to get out of the fire truck. And, uh, and I threw my helmet out, out of the fire truck door, uh, began to collect my own personal gear, like a, my breathing apparatus mask, a personal bag, and, uh, and, uh, and a big heavy lantern. And, uh, uh, and I, I got out of the truck. I gathered up all my goodies, and I put them uh, over between the, the Ford van of where I met, that I mentioned, mentioned earlier, and I placed these items in an area that I thought would be out of the way of traffic and I would be able to find these items later on knowing that I would need them. I immediately turned around and go back into the firehouse and I'm looking at my fire pants and coat, or, well, at least my fire pants and boots. Everything that was in the firehouse that was on the ceiling or that was on the, or on the, on the walls is now on the floor. The firehouse had an incredible amount of force blown into it. Uh, so my, I, I, maybe I should also say that the apparatus, the firehouse apparatus door was up, was open. Uh, there was also an enormous amount of debris that was blown into the firehouse. Part of the part of a magnolia tree was back in the back of the firehouse, and it was on fire. I remember I remember seeing that tree in there when I'm looking at my pants and boots, and I'm thinking, how did how did we get that down here today? You know, it's just confusing. Well, I'm. My, my pants and boots are full of trash and everything, and I also noticed that my left, what turns out to be my left shoulder suspender, is on fire. As you can imagine, the material that uh, makes up the fire turnout gear in th th these modern times, it doesn't burn very well. Uh, it's a fire-resistant type of material. That's good. However, the elastic in these suspenders is, is quite... Uh, obviously burns quite well, and the, sus the suspender was on fire. So I simply reached out with my left foot and tapped on it, tramped on it a couple of times, thinking that that put, put out the fire. And then I'm, th I'm thinking about this, all this trash in my boots and pants, and I'm thinking, man, it'll take, it'll take two weeks to dump all this stuff out. Before I had a chance to give that any more thought, I hear somebody outside the building yell, yell we need help here. So immediately I gave up on that project, went outside, and I, this guy grabs me, and he says, if you can boost me up into this window, we can get these people out of the building. Apparently, this person had ran from a, a, a not quite, a, a, not as severely damaged area of the building as where we were right now. And he recognizes that there are people inside these first floor windows there. And his plan is, if we can get, if we can get, up, if we get somebody up in the window here, we can get these people out of the building. So I do remember this guy very well. He just, his name was Blair Bozak. He was uh, he was retired Air Air Force. He was a Air, United States United States Air Force Academy graduate, Air Force fighter pilot. Uh, his father was a bomber pilot in Europe and and in the Pacific. Uh, and uh, Bozak uh, was a, as I said, he was a fighter pilot, but he also 
later on in his Air Force career, would fly one of the airplanes that he was assigned to was called the SR-71. Some of you may be aware of that. And this thing turned out to be the highest flying, fastest airplane that the Air Force ever designed, or whoever designed it. And uh, became friends with this fellow as well. Um, I hold Blair Bozak responsible for, the, for those people that exited the building at that location there behind the burning fire truck. This, project, this, this plan to, to help these people out of the building probably went on no more than five minutes. Uh, there was also people to, over to our left basically doing the same thing. Uh, as, and it was very difficult for anybody there outside the building to, to be doing what we were doing. Uh, you just couldn't turn your face one way or another to get a, to get a breath of air. And uh, these people are coming out of the building just as fast as we can manhandle them out. Apparently, I guess the first person who came out of the building knocked me over backwards. Um, I don't really remember that, but I. But one of the guys says, "Yeah, we were doing we were doing good there until that one big babe come down on top of Big Al." And I, I said, "What?" He says, "Yeah, don't you remember that big gal that come down on top of you?" And I, I said, "No, well, I remember being on the on the ground, but I just thought I tripped on all that trash out there." He said, "No, that big babe, she come down on top of you and knocked you over backwards." And I'm thinking, well, well, maybe. Well, that's good. I, I, you know, I'm thinking I cushioned her fall, and not only that, I was wearing my fire pants and coat. If you remember a few moments ago, my fire pants were still in the firehouse, and I hadn't put my coat on yet. So, uh, so anyway, we continued this operation no more than five minutes. There was about a dozen or so people that came out of these two windows right there, and I can't tell you if the, I'm sure that there were probably other people further down to our left that were probably involved in doing the same thing. So um, once this once this project comes to an end, I finally go back into the back into the uh, apparatus area. I'm looking at my boots and pants. I simply grabbed the boots and pants, turned them upside down, shook the trash and sticks and rocks and everything out of them, glass, and and I step into my fire pants. When I pull my fire pants up, I realize that my the suspender that I thought I had extinguished from fire earlier. It actually burned from where it was burning all the way to the front of my fire pants. So I only have one suspender. I look like Jethro Bodine, maybe from the Beverly Hillbillies or somebody. The truth is, folks, I didn't need suspenders. My pants fit good. So I immediately put my nylon sock hood on, put on my nylon sock hood, and, uh, and put my fire coat on. I grabbed a lantern. I, I put it on my left arm. I picked up two fire extinguishers. The first fire extinguisher in my right hand was a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. Not a very good fire type of fire extinguisher for what we're what we're getting into. I, I pretty much exhausted it and threw it aside. I pulled the safety pin on the other fire extinguisher. This was a powder dry chemical fire extinguisher. And I go around the back of the fire truck and I go in the building. I am not wearing gloves, not wearing a helmet, and I'm not wearing a breathing apparatus. I had no idea what I'm going to do with a fire extinguisher in a five alarm fire. I probably get in the firehouse, fire state, I'm sorry, the Pentagon, no more than 30 feet. And now I'm down on the floor and I'm trying to think, well, it's supposed to be better air on the floor when you're involved in a situation like this. I just really didn't notice any more, any, any more, it was very difficult to breathe even down on the floor. I've got the lantern in my left hand, and I'm crawling, and I have the fire extinguisher laying on its side, and I'm sl sliding. I would slide the fire extinguisher forward, then I would slide the lantern forward, and, and, I, and I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm certainly conscious of what I'm doing, and I, about the second time I pull the trigger on this fire extinguisher, I hear a woman yell, "Hey!" And it startled me so much that I guess it was the furthest thing that I would, I, I would run into somebody. And I yell, all I could say, I guess, was, hey, back. And one of us says, I can't see you. And we start yelling back and forth. And, I'm, and every time I would see some fire, I would pull this trigger on this fire extinguisher. And this is what, I guess, alerted her. So she gets herself into a position where she is getting closer to the door. And apparently, there is another person who will enter into this scenario. And his name was Chris Brayman. And he was, a, he was a, an Army guy, active duty, I believe, at the time. I've, I've also met Chris several times, uh, and he apparently will escort this lady out of the door through which I entered the Pentagon. So she is out of the building. Her name was Sheila Moody, and uh, the last time I saw Sheila Moody was the 4th of October. It was my birthday this year, 
and we were in Baltimore, uh, the Hyatt, Hyatt, Hyatt Regency Airport in Baltimore, Maryland, and she and her husband had come by there to uh, to, to meet me there, and uh, and we and, and I was actually there with an honor flight group from San Diego, and so that was very special that, that Sheila got to, Sheila and her husband got to meet some of the the uh, honor flight people with whom I've worked before. So that is over, and uh, so it's, uh, I'm out of the building, and, uh, and the first person that I see when I get out of the, f I don't know what I did with that other fire extinguisher, first person I see when I come out of the building is uh, is a victim, and there's about three fellows trying to carry this guy, and uh, so we ended up c helping carry this fellow all the way out to the uh, guardrail, which is probably about uh, 50 yards away, uh, and uh, I immediately turned around and ran back to the uh, Ran back to the uh, the fire ground there, down by back to our near our, our fire truck. By this time, engine 61 is on the scene. It's, this is going to be the first structural engine that will arrive on the fire ground. Engine 61 is a brand new fire truck, also. And uh, uh, are we doing okay? Okay. And, uh, and but well, maybe let me let me back up here a little bit as we're carrying this fellow who appeared to be unconscious, I remember looking down and I see this, this big yellow four-inch fire hose and it's full of water. And that tells me two things. Number one, Fort Myer is on the scene because Fort Myer, Fort Myer was the only company that I know of at that time that had four-inch fire hose uh, in Arlington County. And as I tell this story, you may not understand the rest of it. And the second thing that that reminded me, made, made me aware of is I can't remember what that second thing was. So I'll move on from there. So I began to rendezvous with some of our people. Uh, Vance Valenzo comes up and hugs me and, and uh, the other guys. And Jimmy Angeret, he's in charge of that engine. Uh, Jimmy's still working. And, uh, 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 and I began to do whatever I could to help the company, our people. Uh, I began to take... Uh, I think the biggest project I did after we were working at the windows and I came out of the building was begin to begin to remove all of the salvageable equipment off of the burning fire truck. It was still on fire. At this point, we couldn't do anything about it. Um, so I took all the ho all the fire hose off of the fire truck. Off of the, we had hose cabinets on both sides of that vehicle. I began to take all the breathing apparatus bottles off, breathing apparatus and, and the spare bottles. Also removing the uh, the equipment, the power cords, the floodlights. Things like that. I knew that uh, some of this, some of this equipment was going to be used later on, um, and there's no reason to have it uh, be destroyed for the fire. Uh, this went on for probably. During this time, we were told that there was another airplane coming into the into the uh, Washington D.C. Arlington, Virginia area. We were told to get away from the building, and. Uh, uh, and so we did that, and I remember uh, several times, and this happened a second, maybe even a third time. As I understand, the airplane that was not accounted for at this time turned out to be a FEMA plane coming up from Richmond. Uh, it was for, for whatever reason they couldn't identify, but the airplane landed at, at Ronald Reagan uneventful. Um, I suppose uh, pretty much after that, uh, it became obvious to our like Dennis Gilroy was our acting captain at that point. He was a captain, uh, and when he got when he got on the fire ground uh, earlier, he would he would be the commander of the fire. He would be in charge of the fire fire ground, and and, it, and he would hold that position. You might say temporarily until he would be relieved by a more senior uh, fire fire officer from probably Arlington County. In addition to uh, certainly with uh, Fort Myers uh, Fire Department there. And I might say almost our entire fire department was was involved in that that fire. The, almost all the almost all but six of the entire fire department at Fort Myer was actually involved in taking a class that had to do with airfield firefighting. Uh, Mark and Dennis and I had had it. Ronnie Willett had had it. Uh, John Pine and, uh, and 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 Mike Thayer. They, we since we had had this class, we didn't have to. We didn't have to go to it, but we were the ones, some of us were the ones that got stuck going to the Pentagon or the five-sided Bastille, as I call it. So anyway, we're, uh, I'm doing everything I can to salvage all this equipment, 
And uh, sometime when we were told to withdraw away from the built, away from the the, the, <laughs> the crash site, um, Gilroy is now making Dems Gilroy is now making uh, teams up to go back in and and, re and reattack the fire once we're cleared to go back into the building. Now this is unfortunate that this happened because as the firefighting would stop and, and the firefighters were pulled back, the fire would begin to get away from us. This is really it really was too bad that just that somehow some sort of a miscommunication, but I'm sure that you can realize and imagine how something like that could happen in this situation. So eventually Gilroy has me assigned to Angerette's handline crew and Skipper immediately spoke up and he says, hey, he says, I don't think we're going to be able to help anybody. He said, uh, we all three took quite a bit of smoke up against the building and uh, and then and I said, and I spoke up myself, and I said, I, I, don't, I don't think I can help you. And Gilroy says, what, what's wrong? I said, it's like he should know. And I said, I'm burnt. I'm burnt. <laughs> anyway, so the guys come over, and they started undoing my fire coat and everything. And, and I said, and at this point, I knew there was something wrong with my sh shoulder. Uh, and later on, I, I suppose at some point I thought it might be serious. Like, actually, I thought it was my arm. I thought my arm might be broken, and uh, but it was not. So the guys come over. They started undoing my fire coat and yanking on me, and that's when I realized that the discomfort was actually up here. Um, so I, I guess I was pretty much out of the picture at that point. Eventually, Mark and Dennis would I, Mark and Mark and I would be taken to uh, one of the Arlington uh, County hospitals right there. Um, and uh, we actually wouldn't even go to the, uh, we wouldn't even leave the fire ground until probably around 2.30 that afternoon. And we had about seven or eight people in the back of the med unit that took us to the hospital. I was in the front with, uh, with a medic trainee who'd never driven, <laughs> never driven the ambulance before. So uh, she's probably thought I was crazy when I was telling her to run over the people in the road. Uh, they'll move. And... Uh, but, and a matter of fact, that girl's name was Sandra Melnick, and she turned out the medic trainee, and she turned out to be the number one student, and she, she had the top score in her medic class. So whatever happened to Sandra, all the best. And uh, so eventually uh, uh, I was hurt, and uh, Mark and I would be treated for lacerations and second, first and second degree burns, probably with second degree burns, first degree burns that heal themselves up pretty quick. Uh, Mark had to have a... They took an x-ray of Mark something, maybe his chest, I don't know, and uh, they put some sutures in Mark's hand. I had a cut on one of my fingers that one of the girls in, on, the, on the fire ground put a Band-Aid. I uh, don't even remember which hand or which finger it was. And then uh, uh, Mark and I would eventually be brought back to uh, Fort Myer that evening, probably got back there about, I don't know, maybe 6 o'clock. Uh, everything was different now. As you go through the gate, there's guys there with obviously showing military firearms. Everything had changed, of course. And uh, immediately Mark and I began to be interviewed by people with the badges. A lot of our public affairs people were there. Uh, the base commander was there from Fort Myer. It was very special to, to be concerned, ha you know, have these people concerned about our well-being. And uh, Eventually I would have to have surgery on my left shoulder. Uh, eventually, I think just after Christmas, I was cleared to go back to work. and. Uh, I would continue to work as a firefighter at Fort Myer in Arlington until I was able to, I was forced to retire because of my age. Uh, that Back then, that would have been age 57. And uh, uh, and then immediately after, after I retired, within a week, I had a job working on an island out in the Pacific. And, uh, and I was there for about two and a half months. They were closing this place down. They were going to turn it over to the birds and the, and the fish. As I understand now, that's exactly what it is. It's nothing but an island called Johnston Island. So I came back to Arlington, Virginia. I kept my apartment uh, with arrangements, and I left my, my, my vehicle there at the firehouse. Uh, about a week after that, I run into a friend who worked for one of the tour companies in D.C., and she asked me what I was doing, and I told her I was retired, and she says, we're hiring narrators. You'd be perfect for it. And so for the next two years, I've worked as a tour guide in Washington, D.C. and Arlington Cemetery. It is the most fun job, and it was probably one of the first times I really felt like I was in command of something, 
because when you got all these people on the bus and you got the microphone, unless the bus stops, they can't get off. So it's kind of cute. So even after I moved back to Ohio in 2005, I would I would go over there and work on this tour bus. We had the best people, and that that particular tour company is no longer uh, there in Arlington. I think the the entire touring operation now is is taken over by uh, the National Park Service, I believe. But I will see some of these people here this this coming weekend because I do plan to be in Arlington, uh, Virginia, and also attend the ceremonies, the veteran ceremonies especially the ceremony on November 11, uh, November 11 at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. As I said earlier, I am a Vietnam veteran. Yes. Mr. Wallace, thank you so much. What a wonderful story. What a Can wonderful story. We have thank tons you. of questions okay. coming in. Um, we thought we'd have you kind of explain some of these photos to the kids now that they've heard your story. If you could maybe walk them through some of these photographs um, and explain what it is that um, they're seeing, that might um, kind of help them put a picture together with your story. Okay. Well, the picture that you see now is uh, I actually drew this photograph, drew, drew this picture on a regular size. Uh, piece of copy paper, and it kind of gives you an idea of the, of the location of where the airplane was, where the firehouse was, uh, which is there, that's the firehouse, and then over to the right of that is not that far, that is the fire truck, that's Foam 6-1, as you can see, it's, it's parked perpendicular to the Pentagon, and it's pointed out toward the heliport, and, uh, and, and uh, this is an interesting, there's an interesting reason for having me that I parked it there. As I said earlier, I parked it exactly the same place on September 10 as I did on September 11. I wanted the fire truck out of the firehouse before the Secret Service gets there. These Many times in the past, we would be having these so-called Code 1 standbys, and that would be for the, the president, the vice president, or actually any visiting head of state. And the next thing you know is you're down there, and there's like three Secret Service suburbans, great big uh, cruisers, suburbans parked there, and they're right in front of the apparatus store, and a fire truck might still be inside inside the firehouse. That's a problem. Now, there's two ways to, to solve this. Number one, the fire truck has got enough power just to run over these three SUVs. The best way to solve that problem is to get at, have these vehicles moved so that we can get the fire truck in a position where I want it, as you see in the, in the map here. The... Uh, out in front, you might be able to see out in front of the right front corner of the fire truck, uh, there are some dotted lines. And uh, you, do you see that? On over to the left. Okay. Yeah, this is okay. These dotted lines here represent the path that Skipper and I will take away from the crash truck. The one that's parallel to the Pentagon is. Uh, is my is my path. You see this Ford van, the van of which I spoke earlier. It's right there. I, that's where I crawl underneath the van, crawl out from under the van because of the it was it was so bad the heat. I run out to Skipper, which is where, at that point where the white marker is, the the, the the arrow. Uh huh. And that's the one I told Skipper get your stuff on. And uh, as I say, in a lot of the times that I said it today, I said I yelled to Skipper and said, "Are you okay?" And Skipper did not answer my question. But I do remember what he said. And I left it at that. <laughs> at that point, I run back to the burning fire truck. Um, uh, it's just uh, it's just the way I uh, it's the way I, I operated that. I, I wanted the fire truck out of the building before the Secret Service get there. I remember now. This picture here is this handsome guy is me. You can see my arms are wrapped up, and uh, uh, the glasses that I'm wearing in this picture. When I put them on the next morning, I stayed at the firehouse that that Tuesday night. And when I put those glasses on the next morning, they broke right here between your eyes. So uh, anyway, and the, and the hospital gown that I'm wearing, I'm also wearing, I think by now I'm probably sure I've taken my, no, I'm wearing my uniform trousers and a hospital gown. Uh, when we were in the med unit, they cut my t-shirt open, uh, you know, to see, check on my, what other injuries I might have. And then, uh, and so when we were getting to the hospital, Skipper had found a, a roll of duct tape 
and they cut my t-shirt from the top to the bottom. It's like a zipper, like a jacket, a jacket zipper. Skipper takes his duct tape and duct tapes his t-shirt back together. I don't know where he got the duct tape from. He probably stole it. Anyway, so I am, uh, I am being, the picture was taken by one of the uh, fellows in the, the uh, who, who did uh, that interview. And this is actually on the afternoon, late afternoon of September 11. Uh, the guy had a funny last name, and I'll tell you who he looked like and how he dressed. He dressed like Sam Kennison, if anybody out there remembers what Sam Kennison looked like and acted. Uh, but he did a good, and, and part of this, uh, this was a good, he did a good story. Okay. Oh, oh this is, uh, I think it's a letter of commendation from the Army Chief of Staff, and at that time his name was Eric Shinseki. And... Um, he was, uh, he was from Taiwan, I think, but he was an American uh, Army. Uh, he was a West Point graduate. And, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, and uh, one of the things that, uh, we met, we met, excuse me, we had met him several times, and of course he, he lived right there at Fort Myer. But I'll tell you something about his wife. She would come down, I don't know how soon, uh, probably maybe even that day, of the attack, she would come down to the firehouse over and over and over, and she would sit there and talk to the firefighters. It was just very special that she recognized that there's that might be something that might be something that she just might be of benefit to some one of one of the one of the fellows. Uh, he was a four-star general. He was the Army Chief of Staff, Eric Shinseki, and uh, I might just see him this weekend at the Vietnam War. Ah. Get a stiff neck here. Okay, this picture here is, uh, first of all, the traffic that you see out front is Washington Boulevard. Um, and, uh, uh, and almost in the center of the picture, down. The, oh, that's the four you see now. That was the, that's the firehouse and the flight tower. Um, this, of course, this picture is, is, has, is a lot of time has passed, possibly even several weeks. Uh, where the big part looks like a parking lot over to the right, right there. That is actually most of that. Those vehicles are parked on a, a very solid, uh, actually the heliport pad, and, and, and to the extreme right of the where you see the the Pentagon itself, you see where right there you'll see where the building there was a, when the building was uh, being assembled or built. There was actually an expansion joint there, and. Uh, uh, and, this, and that's where the collapse occurred, just about 30 minutes after the attack. Actually, when that when that uh, building collapsed, we had just moved our big wa for our big uh, water cannon. Kind of looks like a mortar. Instead of shooting bullets, uh, it it actually shoots water, and it mounts on. It can, and we have it mounted on the ground. Well, I wanted to move this thing 50 feet closer to the building, and in order to do that, what I would do is get a 50 foot section of this four inch hose. And we're going to roll the hose out toward the Pentagon, and uh, and then we're going to turn the water to that hose, that that cannon. We're going to turn the water off at the engine, unhook the hose there where the gun, where the cannon is, put the put the additional 50 foot section of hose on it, and put the water cannon at the extreme end of that 50 foot 50 feet closer to the Pentagon. And I'm I am certainly out of breath. Well, once we get that thing up and running and, and if, if you would ever see me in any of the videos, I've usually bent over it like I'm in a, the old-fashioned football huddles. I just, I just couldn't catch my breath. And uh, and Gilroy said, did you see that? And I said, what? He goes, the building just moved. And I thought, so what? And when I stood up, that's when the cornice above the fourth floor just crumbled like, a, like it was hit with cannonballs. And then that's when the building began to fail. And uh, so this picture here is in a lot of the 9-11 books. If you see the green arrow in there, that's one of those one of those magnolia trees. And if you had time to look at the pictures in, in some detail, you'll see that some of the branches are broken off of it. Uh, this is foam 6-1. You can see here underneath the front tires that it's still on fire. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner is a firefighter. That's, that's Dave Flick. The guy with the red fire hose, that's Roger Reardon. Roger's still working. At Fort Myer, that guy with, who's helping Roger with the hose, he is a, probably a Pentagon cop. And this handsome guy here with carrying the, the tools and equipment and, and power cords, that's me. Uh, 
uh, at this point, I'm in the process of trying to remove this equipment off of the off of the truck, so there's, there's, no, there's no sense in having it be destroyed. Okay, this picture here was probably taken uh, several days later. Uh, you can see the collapse, of course, there. Uh, and again, engine 61 was the first structural engine to arrive on the scene. Uh, very proud of those guys. This, the crew that manned that engine was uh, Roger Reardon, um, Fred Ladd, uh, uh, Billy Harrison, and, and, and Captain J uh, James Angerette. Angerette is still working also, as well as Reardon. Um, at this point, I would say the uh, the fire truck has been removed from where it was. Uh, it just you know, they're in the process of trying to clean up all this debris, and of course, this process would go on for uh, six weeks probably uh, before they were ever uh, ever able to begin to do any any restoration. Of course, it would take even more time than that to uh, to uh, begin to or to have plans to. to to make the not just the restoration, but also to, to do the reconstruction on that area. Okay, um, this is why I call it the five-sided Bastille. I might mention that during World War II, my mom my mom worked in what was called then or worked for what was called then the War Department. She would work at the Treasury Annex Building from 1942 to 1943, and then from 1943 to October of 1945, she would work at this five-sided Bastille. She would work at the Pentagon. She worked for a colonel there uh, in the Army. And uh, as I remember her telling me years ago that they had girls there from all the big cities like Atlanta, Philly, New York, uh, Chicago. And, this, and they were actually building this Pentagon right across the, the street from where all these, these young women who came into the Washington area would be living on this so-called army post called Fort Meyer. There were actually, back then, there were two Fort Meyer posts. This one, closest to the Pentagon, would be called the South Post. It was actually, it was actually uh, bigger than, uh, larger than, the, than the, uh, the existing one now, which is the North Post Fort Meyer. Uh, if you look at the lower left-hand corner, you'll see these rows. These are not corn rows. These are actually rows of graves in Arlington National Cemetery. And uh, one of the pictures that we had like this <coughs> actually shows one of the light poles. It would be a clear down in the left hand, but the, I'm sorry, the right hand corner where you see the freeway exiting the, that's one up there. Yeah, yeah, right there. Uh, it would actually, what happened is they picked up, some people picked up one of these light poles and dropped it over behind the guardrail. It's not, it's not visible in this picture, but, uh, but I do remember seeing that, and uh, but you can see that this aerial view of the Pentagon. It appears to be uh, like rings. That's what they're referred to as the outside ring. That one, like we'll say here on the attack side, that is called the that would be identified as the E ring, and then the next ring in would be the the C ring. If I don't if I remember my my uh, spelling and everything, and then the next ring in would be the uh, E ring, D ring, C ring, B ring, and A ring, and then parallel uh, up on top of the roof, you see this. It seems like it's much light. It's it's visible because it's much lighter. You have these like right to the back, right there. You see that? What? That's a cor that's corridor four, and over to the left of that is corridor five. Now they're parallel, so they go from the outside of the building from the E ring all the way into the center court, and uh, there's 10 of those corridors, and, and, and they start over on the other side, one, two, this is three, four, five, and so on. It goes all the way around the building. Now, right in the center of the courtyard there, there's a, there's a structure there, and it's also five-sided. And uh, years ago, I guess, when the Russians got to be, or the Soviets got to being able to uh, uh, decipher aerial photographs or uh, satellite photographs, and all of a sudden, I guess, the story is that Somebody had a, this real good, clear picture of the Pentagon. He said, wow, this is a good picture. You know, this is the headquarters of the Americans' defense. And, then, and so this really must be an important, you know. And if somebody said, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a five-sided building right in the center of this, this courtyard. Well, that has got to be the center of the most important part of the military's defense. And they, got to ref they found out about this assumption 
and that that building became known as the Ground Zero Cafe, <laughs> and it's a hot dog stand. So that's a tr that's true. And I remember when my mother was there after World War II, and they had the big parade that came into the Pentagon. She remember seeing General Eisenhower, and he was severely sunburned from the New York City parade. She remembered he, he had a terrible sunburn. So that's the that's the Pentagon. Yeah. Uh, this picture is taken. It's still in the morning. You can see the, the front part of the fire truck is lighted, and that's because the sun is shining down over top of the Pentagon. Uh, we, you, we may have a picture of the truck. Uh, I don't want to see it yet, but uh, you can take a look at the back of the truck and see the considerable damage uh, well, because the airplane, the airplane, probably the left left wing, it actually hits the fire truck, um, and it it, 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 uh, it, could, it made enough damage to the fire truck that the electronics from the cab would not engage what it took for the for the, for me to be able to move the vehicle. That is really a shame because I had that fire truck running in probably 20 seconds. The, the crash site is only over here like 150 feet. I know, I, I, let me say it this way, I feel that if the fire truck would have done what I wanted it to do, what it should have been able to do, and being that close and, and having the fire truck, having access to the fire truck that soon after the crash, by using the agent to water the foam on the fire truck, I know it would have made a big difference in the spread of the fire. It, just, it would just have to. That would, and so, and so allowing some people to get a little more time to get a little further away to where someone could help them to get into a more safe area. The picture that you see here is the other side of the fire truck and where the green arrow, if you guys see the green arrow, that is a pedestrian door. Uh, that door was blown open. This picture was taken from inside the Pentagon fire station at the heliport. That door was blown open. It never closed. Um, if you look up at the top of the picture, you'll see how the apparatus door is catawampus there. And, uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, you can see all this debris. This, some of this debris might even, you might even recognize as being shrubbery or, or vegetation or something. Back here, where the person is, is taking this, this picture, I guess is um, that is where that that magnolia tree branch, that magnolia tree was was stuck in a wall. I thought it, I described it as a a Christmas tree that was upside down, and I'm thinking, and it's on fire. I'm thinking, how did we get that thing down here today? And uh, so, I've had a lot of uh, thoughts about the, you know what would have happened if the fire truck had been in the firehouse. Uh, it, I do feel it would have probably been exposed to more damage because the front of it would have been uh, all the trash and everything was blown into the, into the into the apparatus area, or the fire truck could have been out of the uh, out. You know, we might have been out there doing something with it, been com completely out of the building. One of the oh, I guess this is secondhand information to me. But one of the guys told me later on. He said. We were, they were doing the examination of the firehouse after the fact, and he said, uh, considering the amount of damage that the fire station sustained, we believe that if the fire truck hadn't have been parked between the crash and the entrance to the firehouse, we believe the firehouse would have been leveled, and there were three people in there. Uh, Dennis, Jackie Kidd, the, the, the military gal, and her partner, who was the lead in lead of the tower. Uh, you can look at some of the trees here over top of the over top of the the fire truck. You can see some of the branches are are, are, are damaged also. Um, in this picture you see of course the, this is more than 30 minutes later and uh, you can see the yellow fire trucks. These were from Ronald Reagan Airport uh, which is only down the road about two miles. Uh, so they were instrumental in knocking a lot of the fire down. Uh, some of these pictures that, that you all have here on this on access to may show some of these fire trucks pumping water. Normally, these type of vehicles carry uh, somewhere around 3,000 gallons of water. And uh, these cannons on top of these trucks have a capacity of anywhere from, uh, we'll say, 800 to 1,000 gallons a minute discharge capacity. 
And uh, when I was a firefighter here at Rickenbacker, uh, we had a, one of the fire trucks that we finally acquired in 1990 was the Oshkosh P-15. It was the biggest, it was the largest fire truck that was ever built to be sold. There were two, ver there were two versions of it. The military version held 6,100 gallons of water. 515 gallons of foam concentrate. This, this foam concentrate is kind of like dishwashing soap. Matter of fact, we used to wash our cars with it. And uh, but uh, the civilian version was only a 4,000 gallon truck, which would be similar to this thing. The truck is still monstrous. Uh, you know, the tires, each tire weighed 17 and wheel weighed 1,700 pounds. Uh, it had eight wheels on it. Uh, but it was the biggest fire truck that was ever built to be sold. Well, I was, excuse me, when I was at Rickenbacker, I, I, we had like a six-week training class on this thing. So, and it took about six weeks to, when they brought the fire truck in, they brought it in without wheels. It was so big. And they, they finally started putting it together, put the wheels on it, put it inside the motor pool area so that they could continue to assemble it. Um, if you ever see the movie Air Force One, those fire, those yellow fire trucks in that movie are the fire trucks that I used to drive at Rickenbacker. Now, I used to think, when I saw the movie, I think it's the last movie I've ever seen, and that was with my daughter back in, like, whatever. And I said, uh, I thought, I saw the movie, and I thought, that's pretty stupid. I knew a little bit about the airplane, too. Uh, not that I can tell you anything about it, but... Um, uh, I was at the, I was at Rickenbacker one day, and I said to one of the guys, I said, "How's the P-15 holding up?" The guy says, "Well, it's doing pretty good, ever since we got both engines rebuilt." And I said, well, "What happened?" He said, "Well, we were pumping water film in Air Force One, and the engines <laughs> blew up." Well, apparently, the, I guess the film people paid to have these. I can't imagine how much it would cost to rebuild one of these things, but it was actually like two fire trucks, separate fire trucks, pointed at each other, two of everything, and. Uh, well, do you I have time to answer a few questions? I was never assigned to it. I was always on the engine of the rescue. You have time to answer some I would questions. drive it just about every day. My son drove it. I hope you're not watching this, Vince. <laughs> Vince was oh, not, a, not at all. He was, I don't know how old he was, 12 or something. I don't know. But anyway. Uh, good question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yes, ma'am. Maybe I, if, if certainly if I'm going on too long, please please stop me. Uh, one of the okay, one of the gals here just asked me, do I still have my fire suit? Your fire suit, uh, the fire coat? No, I do not. I do not have the pants. Uh, at a time we were told uh, that yeah, you guys can keep your fire gear, your pants and coat. So that was fine. Uh, but I, so I taped, I put all my stuff in a bag just like Skipper did, and we duct taped them up real tight, and I took it home. About a month later, Fire Chief Campbell says, you're going to have to bring your stuff in. They want it. I said, okay, I'll bring it in. Uh, so one of the questions that was said to me by one of the guys interviewing me immediately after the crash, he said, I, I guess the smell of jet fuel had to be overwhelming. And I thought, I don't remember that. And Skipper, I said to Skipper, I said, you remember smelling jet fuel? And he goes, of course. So I, I just didn't remember it. So here I am in the fire chief's office, and this, this big, black, heavy plastic bag's got my fire pants and coat in it. And this girl puts on it, this girl who's going to collect this stuff, and she take, puts on a pair of gloves, and she starts cutting into this bag. And I'm standing right over top of her. And uh, as soon as she cut into that bag, I can smell that jet fuel. Isn't that funny? So, no. So, eventually, that fire coat would end up at, at uh, would end up in the 9-11 Museum in New York City. Maybe you knew that. And, uh, and a lot of people have taken pictures of it and stopped by my house and shown, showed it to me. I could have sold it on eBay, you know. I wouldn't have done that. I don't know what I would have done with it. And the fire pants, I don't know what happened to them. Uh, the T-shirts that I was wearing at Skipper, that Skipper duct tape shut. Uh, I think my mom has the T-shirts. <laughs> now, the last thing I heard is she can't find it. <laughs> She's probably in a rag bag someplace. And, uh, and I have the, I have the uh, trousers that I was wearing. It's interesting. I, I wanted to preserve this stuff, so I washed the, uh, I guess I washed the 
shirt and the pants. And I noticed when I took the hung the pants up or whatever I did to them, that a lot of the stitching in the hem of the, of the bottom of the cuffs of the pants had been damaged from. Okay, one of the next questions is, um, like was it scary and how did you make we were it? Working at the windows, the only thing that well, Skipper had his pants pants on, Dennis had his pants coat and, and everything on, and I didn't have anything on but trousers and a t-shirt. So. Yes, go ahead. I'm, I'm still here. No. How did I make it? Yeah, I've often, uh, I, I was expecting somebody to ask me a qu the question, were you afraid? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, I, I knew that as soon as we saw the airplane, I, I yelled something run, I hope, uh, uh, to Skipper. And uh, I am hoping that from the time we, once we see the airplane, that we have, we responded quickly enough that we have at least turned our backs to it. And, uh, you know, and, and we are running. Um, yes, I was certainly afraid. I knew we were in trouble. We had to get away from that area as quickly as possible. And if you recall, assuming the airplane, the nose of the airplane going to say is going to hit the building about 140 feet over back behind us over to our or yeah over to our left as we're we are if, at the time we see the plane uh, the left wing is 65 feet closer to us than that and that is and so I just we needed to be another two or three hundred yards actually uh, on on down the road and how did I get I think the fact that we saw the airplane when we did we were able to put a, even a short distance, maybe 30 feet, before the airplane actually hits the building. And then the fact that, uh, like, just like the reason that I was down there to begin with is because it was the Lord's dealing. And I'm telling you, that's the way I feel about it. I never had the uh, sensation that I was going to be killed. Uh, I, I just never, I just never thought about it. Um, other people had a different, different situation. I knew that. When I crawled out from underneath the, the building, out from underneath the fire, the, the van, the Ford van, um, there was still trash falling down on top of the van. And uh, that's when I saw Skipper and ran out to him. And uh, he was rattled, I'm sure, just as much as, as I would have been. Uh, but I knew we had to do whatever we could. Yeah. And uh, I knew that, you know, a lot of bad things had happened and more than likely there were a lot of, there were a lot of people that had, had just just recently died, so that would be my answer. How did I survive that? It wasn't. Uh, it's certainly anything that I did, or I did for Skipper, okay. or I did for. Um, another question that was similar said: um, During all of what happened, this, even though all what was going through your right mind away, the whole time? All three of us. If we didn't do like, anything, did you keep else yourself focused day, in a certain way? Mark and Dennis and I stayed busy, and did whatever we could until we were taken out of the picture for an hour and a half. And that's what I feel most special about. Does that help? Oh, excellent question. Yeah. I I uh I almost mentioned this just a few just a few moments ago. Uh, what was going through my mind is where are, I said to Skipper, where are they getting these airplanes? The skipper says they're hijacking them. I'm thinking, how could they get an air, how could they get a gun in an airplane? And I'm thinking, oh, the people that work in the airport, they let them, they let them, well, we know that that's not true. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, how could they hijack an airplane? What do they do? They get a bunch of their friends and they push the airplane away from the gate. Another question was, um, well, where were you and what was your reaction when the towers really collapsed? That was confusing to me and I'm sure a lot of other people. And we really didn't find out how they got the upper, how the hijackers got the upper hand from, until some time later. But that was, I thought about that. I just couldn't understand how could these people be doing this? You know, how, how could it be possible? Good question. Uh, actually, I was, uh, as I recall, and I said this down through the years, uh, 
first thing it is is where I'm going to answer first of all where I where I was when the towers collapsed. I was at Fort Myer. Oh no, I was on, I was on the fire ground at the Pentagon when I realized that the towers had collapsed. Was not until like two or three o'clock in the morning. I didn't even know that, that it happened. We were so busy back at the firehouse and then we're, we're constantly talking to people and I'm start even then I had probably started writing the story which I have given a copy to uh, Angela and uh, which would have started out to be like 14 pages of scribble on a, on a legal tablet. Uh, I was not aware until Mickey Thompson said something, something about the towers and he says they're gone. And, uh, and he says something else and he says no they're gone. And I did not realize that they had collapsed until, I'll say, after Well, Mr. Night, Wallace, maybe, we cannot probably, thank you later. enough for your time today. We were to honored like to get you as a speaker and... for our event. Um, this was so offered to grade 6 through 12, but we had a it. really great response. Tons of parents were interested in seeing uh, this as well. So really, what a pleasure it was to have you and to I'm just sure. let our children get exposed to something that a lot of our, their teachers lived through, but they certainly only see it on TV. So what an honor it has been. We thank you so very much for your time. I'd like to say one more thing. Uh, I don't want to argue with anyone's statistics, but uh, oftentimes the number 184 pops up as the number of people who died that day. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, I am going to play um, one more time for our guests. Um, they all sent in photos of their families, and so I want to make sure that those photos get included on the recording. So we will um, play that one more time for them so that they all get a chance to see those pictures roll through the screen. So if you'll give me just a second, I will put that back up for everybody. And play that one more time. <laughs> 